Hi everyone, thanks for coming and sorry for the slight delay. Uh, there were some technical difficulties with the projector. Um, welcome to the first event of the new decade at uh, the Cambridge Union. Um, today we're very honored to be hosting uh, Mr. Hiromichi Mizuno, um, who is the Executive Manager Director and the Chief Investment Officer for the world's biggest pension fund, the Japanese Government Pension Investment Fund, the GPIF where he oversees $1.5 trillion in assets. Um, we're here today, um, so Mr. Mizuno will uh, launch into a, a short sort of speech and then we'll move into an um, informal Q&A uh, and conversation with myself before I will open up the questions to the audience. Um, there's plenty of interesting uh, stuff to talk about uh, and I will be discussing uh, a variety of topics including um, Mr. Mizuno's career, um, his advocacy for ESG principles and his um, uh, su strong support for eco-friendly and responsible investing, uh, as well as his uh, take on student activism uh, on environmental topics within Cambridge, particularly the widespread divestment movement. Um, so it should be a very interesting event. Uh, if we could all lend a very warm round of applause for Mr. Mizuno. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my real honor uh, to be invited to speak at this uh, Cambridge Union. And uh, I've also discovered this is the, uh, the first event in this decade. So I'm pretty honored to do. Uh, when I was asked to join this Cambridge Union, I searched the, um, uh, the, your uh, Twitter and uh, to find out who you guys are. And then I found out you are the oldest, the world oldest, uh, you know, the, uh, the debate society. Actually, I actually uh, the, met the, uh, the Governor Carney of the Bank of England last night and I told him like, oh, I'm going to speak at the, uh, the world oldest the, uh, debate society tomorrow. And he said, are you going, are you going to Oxford? Okay, so I said, I need to double check. And the, uh, the, you know the, what the other uh, Oxford Union says on the, their Twitter? Instead of the oldest, because I think you are the oldest, they said, we are the world's most famous <laughs> debate society. So <laughs> they always find a way to be uh, very competitive. So uh, it's my honor anyway. Um, so... Let me begin with the other, uh, briefly introducing myself under the GPIF. Uh, we are the sole asset manager of Japanese Public Pension Fund. Uh, at the moment, we manage about $1.6 trillion. Uh, I've been in this position for the last five years. Before, I was a part of the private equity fund based in London. Uh, but the, when the Abe, Prime Minister Abe moved into office for his second term, uh, I was asked by uh, the Prime Minister to come back home. I spent the last two decades working abroad, but I was asked to come back home uh, to run this fund. And uh, ever since, I've been managing this fund. And uh, just to take the credit of my work, I mean, uh, every time I do advocate for like, these environmental, social, and governance issues, I received a criticism saying, like, uh, your job is to make money, not to try to save the world. But I have to say, like, I managed to make $480 billion. I say I came into this office. So I'm still making money. But I think making money itself is not good enough uh, in today's world. That's what I'm going to talk today. Starting last year, I started teaching the, the Harvard Business School as well, because the, uh, the Harvard Business School teaches GPIF case uh, featuring myself. Uh, and the title of that, the other, uh, the case study and the class is, should pension funds try to change the world? It's a GPF embrace of the other ESG activities. You know ESG is environmental social governance, which was irrelevant until four years ago. When I started advocating, like all our investment activity have to integrate environmental social governance factors in our analysis, I got a huge pushback from my own team and from the industry saying our job is to make money. Our job is not to make save the world. That's a government role. Or NGO, NGO let them do that. But that is not my job to uh, try to 
to contribute to the society or trying to protect the other uh, global environment. And I keep arguing back, saying, like, uh, you know, we will deliver both. Of course, we can make money, but GPIF the mandate is to make the other, uh, secure the, uh, the uh, public pension scheme for the next several generations. Our mandate is to make a return for the next 20, 30 years. So uh, we expect to grow our fund to $4 trillion by 2050. So uh, our job is to secure that retirement pay. To do that, I really don't think like, uh, you know, the environmental, social, and the governance issues are financially irrelevant. And interestingly, as we keep challenging like, uh, to our industry, including like, big asset managers who counter-argued to me like uh, four years ago, that's not their job to, to care about those kind of things. Now they are saying like, uh, you know, that we have to pay attention to those kind of things, so we want a beauty contest. But at the same time, in the US, there's a huge debate about who owns the business. Milton Friedman, who is a Nobel laureate, made a very, very famous uh, contribution to uh, New York Times in 1970, saying, if there is, I mean, there is only one social responsibility of a corporation is to make profit, if it's not illegal. So what he said was, you know, the, only the purpose of the private business is to make profit, nothing else, if it's not illegal. Is that the way you understand it? But the American, particularly American business leaders, are, they thought it's almost politically incorrect to make a statement saying like a their, you know, the stakeholder is not they are only the uh, shareholders. They have to pay attention to the others. I actually tried to put the uh, slides on, but the, other, the one thing that Cambridge Union didn't do very well is that they think that their uh, projector is not working, so I need to talk through. Uh, <clears throat> when I went to business school, 19, uh, nine, no, sorry, 19, when is that, 93, I went to Northwest and uh, the other uh, Kellogg and for the business and uh, MBA. At that time, you know, the, before I went there, I asked the other uh, Japanese alumni what I should be prepared to go to the business school. And they said, you know, every class is you will be asked how the Japanese company is doing. So you have to be prepared to answer that question. But when I went to the other uh, Kellogg, it was after the Japanese bubble economy crashed. So I never been asked that question. <laughs> So the other, my, you know, the senior Japanese alumni, they always ask, you know, how, 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 how the Japanese company do, right? Because they thought the other, it's the time, it was the 1974, uh, no, sorry, 1984, when the Japan as the number one became the, the, the US, you know, the bestseller. So they, everybody wanted to learn how the Japanese business is doing, because Japan was number one. And when I went there, nobody was interested. And I asked the other junior and alumni of the other, uh, my business school, and uh, how was your situation? They said, I was always asked how the Japanese are doing because as the other role model of failure. <laughs> so the other, it goes in a cycle. But the recently, which is very interesting was, what the other, some people started talking in the US is actually exactly what the other Japanese company ha business has been criticized over the last 20 years. Because the Japanese business has been criticized, we don't pay enough attention to maximizing shareholders' benefits, shareholders' return. And we always claim the company has to serve the client, has to serve the society, and everything else. And it has been criticized. You know, the Japanese corporate has no focus or no accountability. But all of a sudden, starting the last several years, at the same simultaneously as we advocate for the ESG investment, now the U.S. business is saying, uh, last year, Business Roundtable, uh, they made a statement. You know, the maximizing shareholder value is no longer our primary purpose, which created a huge debate, but it's sending the other strong message to the other investment community, like, you know, the, our job as a CEO is not to maximize your return 
Of course, that's a job, but that's not only the purpose of the business. So the purpose-driven business becomes the buzzword. And interestingly, everything I hear uh, you know, from those new you know, the, uh, the, uh, business thinking is actually reasonable very well, because that's how I grew up. Uh, that's exactly the value we believed in as a Japanese. So founder of Evernote, you know Evernote? You use it, right? Founder of Evernote has a vision to make Evernote a 100-year company. And he did his own research, you know, the globally, you know, how many companies has survived more than the 100 years. And he found about 3,000. And 80% of those companies are Japanese. That's very fascinating, right? So the other, we did something right, but on the other hand, we have been criticized that we didn't pay enough attention to maximize shareholders' value. So now, interestingly, uh, in Japan, there's a big movement that the other uh, corporate has to serve the shareholders better. And at the same time, particularly in the US, they are saying the serving shareholders is not only our purpose. So that we actually, the other, you know, the margin uh, towards that the uh, multi-stakeholder capitalism. Now, I'll be speaking at the Davos next week and the World Economic Forum. This year, main theme is a multi-stakeholder capitalism. And uh, Dr. Schwab, that he's a founder of the, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the World Economic Forum, he says from 1970-something, when the, he founded the, the World Economic Forum, he always had the multi-stakeholder capital in his mind, although I never heard, but he said that. And he said he was inspired by his conversation at that time with the Japanese business leaders, business have to serve society. So um, I think we are now at this very interesting time. Everybody questions who owns a business, what's the purpose of the business. And, uh, is a single stakeholder model is being questioned. So when it comes to my role, uh, I manage $1.6 trillion. I don't think you really understand the other you know, sort of magnitude of that size of money. You know, as I said, since I came into the, my office, I made a $460 or $80 billion, depending upon the exchange. And uh, today, I'm going to speak to you about a one hour. I can easily lose $100 million during that time, or I could easily make $100 million during that period of time. So the other money, a huge amount of money is comes with the very scary uh, roller coaster ride. And when I come to this office, you know, I challenged every single conventional wisdom of the other uh, asset management. For example, most of the asset managers evaluate their performance against the market. You know the benchmarking? You know, the asset manager evaluate their bonus to uh, depend upon how much they beat the market. And uh, my organization was running that way. And I just thought it's very strange because the GPF owns about 1% of Japanese equity, about 1% of global equity. And I'm trying to beat the market, I'm trying to shooting in my foot, right? I was just beating myself. So why we try not to beat the market, but to contribute to the market? So uh, I just came up with the idea of we shouldn't focus on how to beat somebody else or how to beat the market. We should contribute to make the capital market more sustainable. So the ESG is environmental social governance integration is one way for me to come up with how we can contribute to the capital market. And it's very difficult because they, as, you, as I said, this industry conventional mindset is you need to beat the market. But I think it's a very weird uh, the concept because everybody trying to beat the market and of course they will just uh, ended up not beating the market because they're basically trying to beat each other, right? And it's not a competition. So um, <clears throat> I challenged the other concept of beating the market is wrong and I got a huge pushback. I created a huge you know, the controversy in the industry. And then I have to come up with the other very effective uh, communication to, to the other uh, make my points. So I came up with the other uh, idea of the other uh, universal ownership. That's what the other, uh, like now Cambridge is starting like a research on that. Universal ownership is the idea of, you know, conventional wisdom of the asset management is, if you pick the good company and sell the wrong one, the bad one, you beat the market, right? 
But the universal ownership is the, is the, is the concept that actually we own the whole universe. So we just cannot be, you know, they cannot be out from the universe. So let's say we will contribute to make the universe better. But that's actually quite innovative uh, approaches. And uh, it took me about one year to persuade my own people and also the other market. But now it's becoming very the big buzzword. So we are saying we own the universe and we try to make it better. And the second one is like, uh, in our industry, long term is a very difficult thing to achieve because everybody has a so, so much short termism. They're trying to achieve the return very quickly. And that we ended up putting a pressure on the company to make a return and make the profit of the very short term and uh, send the wrong signal to the uh, corporate executive to run their business, you know, to make the return at the short term at the expense of their long term sustainability and also the, uh, the, at the expense of their society and at the expense of the other uh, environment. And we keep telling them that's wrong and we need to just uh, promote the long-termism. So GPF just uh, decided to become a guardian of long-termism. And uh, if you search GPIF and a stock lending, you will see hundreds of the other articles over the last month, just a month. Because they, the, the beginning of December, we announced that we are gonna stop stock lending. I don't know how many of you understand the stock lending, but how many of you understand the short selling? Right, okay. Short selling is, has been regarded as the contributor to the, cap, the stock market by providing more liquidity or promoting much quicker price discovery mechanism of the stock market. And uh, GPF used to make $100 million a year by stock lending. So basically, we lend the stock to the people who want to sell short. And it's easy money. But on the other hand, I just came to, there's a came to question they are the, is it really adding any value to the society to we help the people to go short and put the pressure on a corporate executive? And uh, so I spent one and a half years persuading my own team and our board and the, the finally, the beginning of December, we announced that we are gonna stop stock lending. And it's very hard because for anybody, just making a public statement, we are going to give up $100 million easy money is a tough choice. But we decided to stand behind the other principle. And uh, on the same day, I sent a text to uh, Elon Musk and I said, tweet it. And he tweeted it. And I said, bravo. <laughs> and then uh, it's created a global debate. But now, the, the debate is still going on because some people think it's against my professional Monday to give up easy profit. And I keep saying, like, you know, the easy profit is just, is that really contributing to make the, the long-term sustainable performance or not? I'm, I'm quite doubtful. And uh, you see the industry like the, the asset management, you have hundreds of very smart people, but they are very technically smart, but they're holistic, holistically stupid. Right? So the, what we are saying is, what they are saying is right here and there, but when you see the, uh, the big picture, what they are doing is not very consistent. So this one is a very, very interesting, the other uh, challenges, and uh, it is called biggest bombshell in the uh, asset money industry for the last several decades. And uh, we are still uh, getting a lot of like, uh, you know, the push, you know, the criticism also supporting uh, about our decision. But the... Uh, it is very interesting that the other, you know, the, in, the financial market, which we used to believe functioning well, and uh, we used to believe that the other, if everybody trying to optimize their own benefit, got invisible hand will sort it out. But if you look at the, what's happening in, uh, you know, the, in this global, you know, global uh, capital market and the society, I really don't think that we should overestimate the got invisible hand. Adam Smith, he is only known for the uh, God the Invisible Hand, but the, he has been an advocate of the uh, long-termism of like a systemic optimization. But we just uh, picked his part of like, uh, the, uh, the God the Invisible Hand. And I'm not religious, to be honest, but the, um, I always tell the, uh, I mean, I work with the other uh, Pope Francis on the uh, you know, advocacy for the uh, sustainable capital market. And I always tell them the other, uh, even the God was wrong from the beginning because he didn't expect the other uh, able to eat the apple. 
<laughs> so uh, we just cannot expect that God will solve everything. I mean, just the, uh, we just need to be responsible. And uh, capital market is not functioning as we expected. And uh, we just need to just to make sure that we can contribute uh, to make the capital market more, market more sustainable. And uh, for the capital market to be sustainable, society must be sustainable. For the society to be sustainable, the environment must be sustainable. That's a chain of sustainability. And uh, GPIF is trying to do everything to just uh, promote that. And every single action we take seems to, uh, you know, the promote the controversy. But, you know, this society is basically, they, 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 you have to be controversial. Like, uh, this, um, this is a free speech. The problem is, our business, I, I just cannot speak. I have to put the money behind it. And uh, I have to live with the consequence. So uh, I don't have the, as much the, uh, the freedom of speech, but the, I have a freedom of the uh, asset allocation, and I just are trying to just solve the problem in a way, in my capacity. So um, I just want to uh, have more you know, discussion with you guys. So uh, I'm just going to finish up here. And then um, I don't think I was very clear, but I just wanted to say, like, you know, even the capital market, which we believe in, that's functioning, is obviously not functioning. And our, you know, the belief in the uh, capitalism is now being challenged. You know, the other uh, classes I started teaching at the Harvard Business School, I'll be invited to Harvard Business School next month as GPIF's case study became a mandatory for full uh, first year students. So I'm going to speak to the 900 Harvard Business School first year about the R E S G activities and our, you know, the other uh, case study. So uh, when I went to the business school in the U.S., we used to think the Harvard Business School teaches how to take, how to take from the society, how to take from the capital market, not to give. But now they are questioning themselves: Is that the right thing to they should the right thing they should learn at the Harvard Business School? So, even Harvard Business School now questioning the capital market capitalism is actually should be revised or reimagined. And uh, I believe that they should you guys should re rethink, you know, the, what the capitalism should serve for you for the next 30, 40 years, because otherwise, you know, it's going to have a get we're going to get another. Lehman crisis, magnitude of financial crisis. So thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take a question and have a discussion with you. Thank you.